This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 8. Now before we get started, I want to make a short announcement. For those of you who want to study ahead a little bit in Revelation, on the website, if you go to um, Adult Lessons and go down to New Testament, Scroll over to Revelation. You have to be careful there because there's so many books now that it gets off the screen. So you have to carefully scroll up depending on your um, device. There are lessons there that you can study sometimes as many as five ahead. But uh, I try to stay ahead on that a little bit. That's kind of a place where I store up my lessons in case something happens on my end. All right, let's prepare ourselves by making sure we have confessed our known sins at the same time we're allowing a spirit to control us. Let's pray. Well, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the freedom that we have still. We ask also that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, we studied through chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, which included another scene in John's vision. We saw the 144,000 who were with the Lamb on Mount Zion in the future millennial kingdom on earth. The verse goes on to describe something of their stellar character. Let's read 1 through 5, and then we'll pick up on 6 and 7. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. Now the voice I heard was like harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, they are blameless. Now the next passage begins the announcements of the three angels. So we have three angels urge repentance and give warning. That's a summary of their messages. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. Then I saw an angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and and the springs of water. Now the second angel's message also goes worldwide. This one is on the destruction of Babylon. This is part of the judgment just mentioned in verse 7 and is in part the result of rejecting the eternal gospel in verse 6. So these are linked together as well as both being angels giving this worldwide message. It is a preview of what is coming up with the last bold judgment on Babylon. Verse 8. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality like we had a brief announcement of the first beast before the full description in chapter 13. So we have a brief announcement of Babylon and its fall before the fuller description in chapter 17. So we're sort of introduced uh, to Babylon as a player in the end times. Let's break this down a little bit. Another angel, a second followed. 
So we're about to have another major event being announced by an angel during this interlude. Remember, we're winding up this uh, interlude. Saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. This is a quote from Isaiah 21.9. Now let's talk about Babylon. First, the old one. Babylon was the capital of Babylonia, the country, and became a shortened name for the nation. So when you talk about Babylon, you could be talking about the capital city or you could be talking about the nation. Usually, uh, people think of it as uh, the nation. As a nation, they conquered much of the world in those days. They would finally be defeated by Persia who released the Jews to go back to the land after 70 years of captivity. Now, Isaiah was a prophet who looked into the future of the capture of the southern kingdom of Judah by Babylon. In the vision, he has a lookout posted on the watchtower. He is to report what he sees. So he's up there waiting for uh, whoever comes so he can report it down to the people below, the leaders, from Isaiah 21, 9. Now behold, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen in pairs. And one said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. So let me sum this up again. This is Isaiah, who's predicting to the future. Uh, this is even before Babylon has captured Judah, but he's predicting their fall. We also see a similar passage on Babylon falling in Jeremiah 51.8. Notice the second part of this, the last line it says, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. This speaks of their idol worship and evil and being against God and his people. So we should be learning early on that Babylon was an evil nation. God used an evil nation to um, destroy Judah, who had been disobedient. And of course, if you know the story, and well, it's in Daniel, primarily people are familiar with that, uh, who was taken captive along with his friends at the fall of Judah by Babylon. They were a, Babylon was a major world power. They took over many peoples and nations in that area. And the Bible refers to them basically as a empire because that is the center of, well, our interest in and around Judah. So Babylon, let's go over this again. I want to make sure we understand uh, the character of Babylon. It was a world power uh, in Jeremiah and Daniel's day. They were Israel's enemies, enemies of God's people. They invaded and destroyed many of the structures in Judah and Jerusalem, including the temple, and took into captivity Daniel, his friends, and thousands of others, as well as killed thousands of Jews. And as a world empire, they swept over a number of nations and took control of their peoples and rulers and imposed their dominance over them. Many of your Bibles will have in back the maps and one of those will often include the major empires in the ancient world back during the bible days the old testament one of them will be babylon so babylon became symbolic of an evil empire uh, characterized by demonic activity idol worship they go hand in hand plus they ruled over god's people in the land of Judah. Those are some important points to remember. Idol worship, evil empire, uh, not only ruled over God's people, but much of the world at that time. Now, when Rome comes along, they basically fit this same description. In fact, Peter even addresses Rome as Babylon 
figuratively speaking, 1 Peter 5.13. Rome was also a conglomeration of nations and peoples into an empire with its idol worship, demonic and even evil rulers, and they also destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, just like Babylon had. The ancient Babylonia, or the original capital city Babylon on the Euphrates, was not an issue in John's day. Now, this is an interesting aside. If you were around in the 1990s and knew something of Scripture and were keeping up on things, back in the 1990s, there were some scholars who thought that the modern Babylon, or Iraq as we call it, uh, at the time under Saddam Hussein, that Babylon would possibly come back. Saddam Hussein spoke about that, bringing them back to their old glory. And again, it's Iraq now. And they wanted to, these scholars want to tie this into the future prophecy of Babylon and say that this is going to be the literal Babylon. They had a little evidence on that, but it was really pretty weak. And of course, that did not happen. So we're back to looking for a future Babylon uh, by some of these same scholars, those who are alive now. But understand, the future Babylon will have some of the same characteristics as the original Babylon and that of Rome I. The identification of it at this point in its location in our study remains open at this point. We'll uh, discuss this uh, in detail later when we get a lot more information about Babylonia or Babylon, the future mystery Babylon. However, it does arise and is in existence during Rome too. So Babylon, what we're talking about here, the one that's fallen will be in existence when Rome too comes into existence. And we should keep that in mind at this point in Revelation. So it's a player now. It exists uh, at this time in the tribulation. So in Revelation, we're speaking of the eschatological Babylon. That's the one that's going to fall. It hasn't come yet, but it will come, it will form, and then it will fall. And the fall of the eschatological Babylon, I've finally got to where I can say that word good, eschatological the fall of the eschatological Babylon is described in Revelation 18, 2 through 24. And what we have here in verse 8 is just a brief preview of that in this interlude. Obviously, the fact that it's predicted to fall indicates that it must first rise. And that's no small point because that hasn't happened yet. Or if it has no one's confirmed its identification as Babylon. We have to wait and see what happens because the tribulation hasn't started. But for it to fit the eschatological Babylon, it has to be a powerful entity of some sort as the rest of this verse indicates. So let's continue. So it goes on to say, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now this line, one I've got highlighted, says a lot. It's a mixed metaphor making two strong points and we've got to develop these. Babylon is powerful enough to control the nations of the world. And she dominates through sexual immorality. And we need to discuss that as well. That's a major feature here in its description. Now, there's no nation right now dominating the world. There is one who influences much of the world, and that's the United States. Uh, China is uh, coming up, as everyone knows. I don't think Russia is an issue anymore, though some might say the European combined, uh, as it is, uh, may compete with the United States, but we don't know what's going to happen just yet. So we need to be open to who's going to be Babylon or maybe some other in the distant, more distant future. Let's just leave it as it is right now as we get more of a description. 
Notice the word is she. It's common to call a country she, but also at the same time, she's personified. Babylon is personified as if uh, she is a person. Now, look at the next line. Who made all nations, all nations. Ethos is the word, ethnos rather, common word. In the New Testament, uh, it can mean nations or it often refers to the Gentiles. So either way, it amounts to the same. It's not the Jews. It's not talking about the Jews here. It's talking about the nations or the rest of the people, which are Gentiles. So basically, it has worldwide dominance. Babylon is seen to have control over all the nations. Now, that's just what we're reading so far. Just these two lines, finishing the uh, second one here, she has worldwide dominance. She is seen to have control over all the nations. And notice how it happens. She may drink. All right. Drink. Now, let me talk about this for a moment. The word for drink, potizo. Um, it's in the perfect tense and put in a way that it is saying, basically, she made them drink. It's completed in past action. Babylon has already made the nations drink at the point that she falls. You get it? So Babylon, who has already controlled the nations and makes the nations drink, that's uh, the drinking has already happened. They've already taken control, and then they fall. That's why it's important to look at the, well, we call them tenses in the English of the verbs. And so this happens before the falling. What happens? She makes them drink the last line. The wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, this is an important phrase to understand. It's not as simple as it looks. Uh, let's talk about the word passion, first of all. The word passion is basically just what it says. It is an emotional word. Uh, the word is thumos, strong feeling that can be passion or anger. It is used both ways in this passage here and as a word play. Verse 10 uses the same word but for wrath. But here it is to be used for the uh, meaning of passion. The passion of her sexual immorality. Now, this is a key word as, as well in the way it's being used. Now, we all know what sexual immorality is. It's sex outside marriage. Uh, if you are married and you have sex outside marriage, it's some form of adultery. So this person is uh, not married necessarily but committing sexual immorality. Now, married people can also commit sexual immorality, but they usually call it adultery in some form, particularly if it's a, another uh, of the opposite sex. Our word is pornea. And you've, of course, seen this many times. It means fornication. It can mean prostitution, uh, uh, unless it's sex of some sort. Now, Remember the background. Let me go over some of it for you. Drunkenness on wine was often part of the ritual in idol worship, along with sexual immorality. You want to go worship Dionysus, the god of wine, get drunk, and have sex. Now, here it seems to be a driving force behind the power of Babylon, connected with beast worship. Now, we'll tie them in a little closer, so that'll be clarified. So here it seems to be driving force behind the power of Babylon connected with beast worship. So the way it's said is that sexual immorality is what pushes the power behind Babylon over the nations. But it's more than just literal sexual immorality, as I'll continue to explain. 
Now remember, and folks, this is important. When you have idolatry, I've already mentioned it's tied in with demonic activity. During Babylon's dominance, there's going to be powerful, powerful demonic activity. Uh, unseen power behind Babylon. What we see now and know about is mild compared to the sexual immorality promoted by future Babylon. I'm going to discuss, discuss a little bit more about that in a few moments, but I want to do an important aside and make a distinction that we need to understand. It, it's an important one, so let's listen carefully. Most of us are probably familiar with Israel's special relationship with the Lord in the Old Testament, especially as we see it come out many, many times in different ways. But one of the unique things about Israel is that their special relationship was analogous to the Lord being the husband and Israel being the wife, so that when Israel was apostate, it was like her being an unfaithful wife. She was a, a viewed as an adulterous wife. In fact, spiritual adultery is a major theme in the Old Testament relating to Israel and their relationship with God. Let me just read you a few verses. There's many, many, but let's get in the uh, idea of thinking what this is here for a moment by reading the scripture itself. Isaiah 54, 5, For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. Jeremiah 3, 9, and because of the thoughtlessness of her prostitution, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. There's a obvious idolatry here. Jeremiah 3.20, But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. So that's an established fact. That's a theme. There's a number of verses. Uh, let me just give you a few others. I'll put them on the screen. Jeremiah 9, 2, 3, 20, Isaiah 1, 21, 57, 8, Ezekiel 6, 9, 6, 15, 6, 30. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 16, that's something one might want to read through if you want to get some detail on this. Now, spiritual adultery could also be committed by Christians loving the world more and also considered being enemies of God. We see that in James 4. But understand that's based upon having a relationship with God. That's with Christians. So Israel has a special relationship with God, and when they're unfaithful, they're called adulteresses. Christians can be similar in a way in that they commit spiritual adultery when they stray from the Lord and get deep into sin. Now, with all that said about spiritual adultery with Israel and even Christians, Babylon, or the world, for that matter, is not Israel. They're not Christians. So they don't have that relationship so that we can call them adulteresses. However, the term we see used is sexual immorality. Now, again, listen carefully. Sexual immorality in the ancient world was often linked to idolatry because the idolatry was in the temples, and the temples involved, temple worship involved sexual uh, immorality in, in many forms. So it becomes equivalent. Let me just write this out so we can make sure we understand this. Sexual immorality. We have it connected to idolatry. And generally speaking, anything that comes before God is idolatry. This is characteristic of Babylon. Literal sexual immorality, but also in a general sense, since it leads into idolatry and vice versa, we're talking about any anti-God or Christian or Christ activity, okay? 
So Babylon is full of anti-God activity. We can call it, in the analogy here, uh, the connection with idolatry, sexual immorality. So that's the idea we want to see behind here. They're big on anything anti-God. Now just think of it, of course, with the beast being uh, hailed as Christ, we would expect that. So, folks, what I'm saying is, if you're living during the tribulation, you're going to be surrounded by idolatry, sexual immorality, and anti-God activity. And yes, a lot of that goes on now. But the degree is going to be so severe, they're not going to want you to survive. You're in their way, even being alive. Now, I mentioned the term for sexual immorality is pornea. This board is something else trying to write on, pornea. Of course, we get words like pornography off of that, pornographic, things like that. It's used four more times for Babylon in Revelation 17, 2, and 4, 18, 3, and 19, 2. So it is Babylon. Babylon, basically, you can say it's a nation of idolatry, sexual immorality. Babylon uses idolatry to get people involved into sexual immorality and vice versa. They use sexual immorality to get people involved into idolatry. So they make sexual immorality easy and acceptable. And it was part of the idolatry uh, of, of the religion. So it was all being, you want to be religious? Be immoral. Be anti-God. That's the religion of Babylon. And remember, since people are driven now by their sexual lust, their lust, wanting to work against God all the time, then that is going to be the driving, the driving motive behind uh, the religion. Babylon leads the way in making the world turn against God. It's all set up that way. Now, <clears throat> we know how bad society is today and the fact that we just accept the fact that we live in the cosmos diabolicus. And generally speaking, the world is against God. Though Christians do stand out and they bring light and truth in their lives and should do it as well as good churches. So you can just imagine well, let's look at it this way. We just saw the mention of the beast in chapter 13. And now we see in chapter 14 some final announcements that include the fall of Babylon. These are some of the results of judgments. There's a link, obviously, between the future beast and the future Babylon. We see more of them working together in chapter 17. Babylon, listen, is wealth, wealthy, powerful, a military power, sinfully filthy, a corrupt empire drunk on her own adulteries, her own sexual immorality, um, which also corrupts the many nations, and they slaughter the saints. Now, um, technically speaking, sexual immorality can include adultery. So, it'll be almost considered normal, if not considered normal, to do what you want to sexually in Babylon. However, and we'll be getting to this, she will drink the cup of God's wrath, as we see previewed next. So her activity is going to lead to God's wrath being poured out, on her, poured out on her like she's been drinking the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So now she's going to get a cup of something else, and that's God's wrath. So now we come to the third angel's message that goes worldwide, judgment on 
the beast worshipers. We just had it with Babylon, now on the beast worshipers. Verse 9. Another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. So here we see the, the, the setup. All right. Uh, here, here's the condition. Let's pick this condition apart. All right. The result is going to be judgment. But let's just look at the condition. So on another angel... A third followed them, that's the first two angels, saying with a loud voice, it's urgent and everyone can hear, so there's no excuse here either. All right, just like they heard the eternal gospel. Here's the reason for the judgment as stated clearly. If anyone, if you're out there and you've received this mark, if, you've, if anyone worships the beast and its image and you receive a mark in his forehead or on his hand, if you're marked like that, Here's what's going to happen. Look how it's put. Verse 10 is the judgment. He will also drink the wine of God's wrath that has been mixed undiluted. That means it's full strength in the cup of his wrath. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur and the presence of the holy angels and before the lamb. So let's break this down. First line, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath. The result of worshiping the beast and having the mark is you're going to drink God's wrath. Period. Over and out. Listen to how this drink is mixed. It's said rather in an odd way that has been mixed undiluted full strength. Now, a little bit about the wine drinking in those days. With meals, wine was usually mixed with water. One to one to one. Uh, one to three to delete to dil dilute it so they would put water in it equally and then maybe three times more water to make it weaker don't ever think the wine was an alcoholic uh, to think that it was an alcoholic is, is an insult to jews uh, the ancient world in other words this wrath if it was literally a wine literally a wine you wouldn't have any water in it it'd be undiluted that's the point so we put in full strength to make it clear what we're trying to communicate here. And the only people that drunk for full strength wine, their objective was to get drunk. That's why you drink it. It's so powerful. You might as well drink straight alcohol. The point is that there is no letting up on the wrath here. It is full strength. Notice how it's put in the cup of his wrath, or we could say anger. They will get the full brunt of judgment in their punishment. Sinful creatures who reject re redemption are continually and eternally burned. Now, this is given some detail, too. So God turned the wine of passion, thumos, same word, remember, for anger or wrath. God turned the wine of passion, thumos, of sexual immorality, of Babylon to the content of the cup of his wrath. Whoever drinks from the cup of the wine of sexual immorality will drink the cup of God's wrath, Thumas. And notice what happens. Third line, and he'll be tormented. The word for tormented. This is so awful. I'm going to take my time through it uh, just so you can be impressed with what it's saying. Baza needs so is the word. It means to inflict grievous pain to the body, often with physical diseases or uh, principally uh, judicial punishment. And what this amounts to is, is that the unbeliever is going to have a body designed to not be destroyed with the grievous pain and punishment that goes on continuously. As a believer, you will receive a resurrection body or one transformed, depending on whether you're alive at, at the time. But either way, you'll get an eternal body, an immortal body that will go on forever 
will never be subject to disease or pain and so on. But the unbeliever, these earth dwellers, they're going to get a body that's going to be able to um, withstand. It'll be awful, awful continuous punishment. In other words, they won't be destroyed. This word for torments, the word that the demons beg Jesus not to do to them, they beg Jesus not to torment them, Matthew 8, 29, Mark 5, 7, Luke 8, 28. This is how the earth dwellers described what the two witnesses were doing to them before the beast executed them, Revelation eleven ten. We've seen it also. We've seen it also with the locust scorpions. This is what they did to people for five months. They tormented them. Revelation nine five. Now let's look at some detail on this. Next line with fire. Obviously, we know what fire is and sulfur. Let's talk about the sulfur for a moment. Probably one of the pictures that come to mind here that we can relate to is lava, volcanic lava burning stone sulfur the word sulfur it is theon it's also called brimstone it's an asphalt type of material that burns and refers to the kinds of burning hot rocks involved in volcanic eruptions this is the moment and the final judgment when an unbeliever receives his penalty and is thrown into the lake of fire. 19, 20, 20, 14, and 15. And notice it's done in the presence of the holy angels and before the Lamb. This is the heavenly council who take part in these judicial proceedings. We see that in Daniel 7, 9 through 12 and Luke 12, 9. So the final scene here for the unbeliever is in the lake of fire burning. And it doesn't end. Listen to verse 11. And the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Those who worship the beast in his image and anyone who receives the mark of his name. First phrase, in the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. This eternal smoke goes up, going up, indicates that the burning and their torment continues on forever. It's worth noting that smoke can have a positive and negative function in Scripture. We've seen that. It can signify torment as we have it here, but also signify worship and prayers like we have seen with burning incense going up to God back in Revelation 4, 8 and 15, 8 that we have yet to come to. Now listen to this. In a sense here, we have a double meaning and it's rather sobering also. Not only as a sign of judgment, this smoke going up and punishment, but as pleasing the justice of a holy God and the carrying out of the penalty for those who live for sin and evil. Let me read that again. In a sense, we have a double meaning, not only as a sign of judgment and punishment, but as pleasing the justice of a holy God and the carrying out of the penalty for those who live for evil and sin. In the final judgment of Babylon, the smoke of her destruction goes up forever and ever. We'll see that in 19.3. And there's also the shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. We'll see that in right before that uh, celebration in 19.1b through 2a. Let's continue. And they have no rest, day or night. Never any rest. It never lets up. 
always suffering from the burning torment. This is quite the opposite of the worship of the living creatures back in Revelation 4.8 and the service that goes on day and night before the throne of the victorious saints, 7.15. And you know, when we think about this, I, I know it's very sobering. And we think, oh my goodness, this is going to happen to every unbeliever. Every unbeliever. And there's no let up of the pain that continues on and on. Let's continue. Those who worship the beast and his image and anyone who receives the mark of his name, these are the ones that's going to get this severe torment forever and have no rest. These earth dwellers, rejectors of Christ, who worship the beast, his image, took the mark, will suffer eternal torment in the lake of fire. And let's not forget, God is perfectly fair. Every human being has has had God revealed to them in nature, within the inner part of man that knows basically right from wrong until the person begins to deny that, his conscience becomes uh, scarred and eventually insensitive to sin. Uh, so they never may have any uh, hearing of the gospel because they never wanted it in the first place. So they don't know God. That's a choice. They never know Christ. That's a choice. They hear the gospel now and then throughout their lives. Your people talk about God and they intentionally reject any relationship or knowing him throughout their lives. God sent his own son to die on their behalf. He died for their sin. He, God has to deal with sin. And he provides man the gift of his own son to give them a path, not only to him, but away from this torment. They are saved from that. In verse 12, we see another statement about the importance of endurance. Kind of wraps this section up. And it's one that's a little developed here, and I want us to spend a little time on it. <clears throat> In verse 12, we see this expanded definition. It also tells us the importance of endurance. Here it is. Now, this is said different ways in your translation. It can say, this is the endurance, or here is the endurance. This is what you're going to need of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Christ. Now, this connects back to one of the earlier sayings in this three-chapter interlude. Remember, it started back chapter 12. In chapter 12, verse 17, after it's announced that the dragon was waging war on the woman's offspring, here's what was said after that. These offspring are described as who were keeping the commandments of God and holding to the testimony of Jesus. This is obedience. I'll put it in one word, obedience. So let's tie this in. Endurance of the saints, they're described as those who keep the commandments or they're obedient. And then in 1310, after the believer is told to be ready and accepting of God's will, if comes captivity or martyrdom, we hear this statement that we're reading now. Here's the endurance. But it says, and faith of the saints. Notice there's the word endurance again. And then in 1310, excuse me, 1318, before calculating the number of the beast, we have a simple statement that says, this is wisdom or here is wisdom. 1318. Again, that can be translated this or here. So what I'm saying is in this verse, verse 12, 14, 12, there are words from all three of these previous statements. 
this, and then we see commandments and faith. Verse 12 sums up everything that is needed to get through the challenges presented to the believer in this interlude where we see all these things going on. We see the dragon, we see the beast, we see Babylon. We see the forced mark of the beast, the forced worship for the beast. If you endure, you keep those commandments, and you stay faithful, you'll get through it. This is what you need to remember. This is what endurance is. This is how it is shown under the most difficult pressures to give in to the beast and his demands who the world follows. And folks, I can tell you right now, now is your practice time. Now is the time you need to learn this, to be obedient, to learn the word, to grow in the word, to keep the commandments. Just don't study the word for curiosity or fill in the gaps. Learn it as if your life depended on it. So let's just break this verse down when it says, here's the endurance of the saints. This is what endurance is. Who keep the commandments of God. Endurance shows itself in being obedient, staying true to the word of God. Obedience. Now, of course, connected to that's the obvious. You have to learn it to be obedient. Well, I didn't know because you didn't study. I didn't know the law, officer. Well, you're responsible to know the law when it comes to traffic laws. Read the signs, so on. Last line, and their faith in Christ, or faith in Jesus, rather, it is the objective genitive from the little translation, faith of Jesus. The Greek says faith of Jesus, so you have to determine whether you've got an objective genitive or not. So basically, this is saying being faithful to Christ, being faithful to Jesus. It's a living faith, living faith. And all the things I've talked about here, endurance and keep the commandments, if you have a living faith, that comes with it because you're always living by faith. How do you live by faith? It's not just believing, but it's believing the word of God that you're supposed to know. Now, I'm not trying to sound harsh here. I'm trying to sound as if I'm a, well, you might say a pastor to a congregation or a father to a son. Folks, you've got to know this. Or you're going to be in trouble if you're looking forward to the tribulation. You have to have a living faith right now. You're trusting God every day throughout your life on the big things and the little things. When it says here is the endurance, wisdom is enduring to keep the commandments. It'll be a wise Christian, keep the commandments. Uh, live by the Spirit. I always want to remind people that we don't live under the Old Testament Ten Commandments, though nine of them actually apply today, but you do that in the power of the Spirit. It's staying obedient and staying faithful during the time you have left in your earthly life until death or Christ returns. And then I like to say for that big roundup in the sky, when he pulls everybody up who are believers. The big call here connected to being obedient and staying faithful is endurance. It is the seventh and last time we see it in Revelation. We've seen it in 1, 9, 2, 2, and 3, uh, uh, 19 as well, 2, 19, 3, 10, 13, 10, 14, 12. All right. 14, 12 is our last time. Verse 13, the eternal status of faithful believers. A very interesting verse. Verse 13, the eternal status of faithful believers. So here's your status. We've heard all this bad stuff that we don't have anything to do with. Verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. This verse is loaded. First phrase, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, a heavenly voice again sounds out. Here it is likely God doesn't identify it, 
but it doesn't mention it being an angel, being an angel like we've seen previously. It emphasizes the important emphasizes the importance of the message because it's from heaven. Anything comes out of heaven, you better listen. Here's what John's told. Write this. Tells us that this is what John is to do. God is using him to deliver this message to the readers, to us. He's to write. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Simply put, there is blessing in eternity for those who stay faithful to the point of dying in the Lord. And this most intense time, and then it goes on to say, from now on. This is to motivate those believers undergoing intense pressure to understand that God says from heaven, you are blessed. This line reassures believers who stay faithful at the most intense period. They're blessed. God considers them blessed. These are those martyrs who stay faithful up till the end. Or if you make it all the way to Christ coming to pick you up for the big roundup. They're blessed for doing so. This is following in Christ's footsteps to his death on the cross if it calls for martyrdom. This is participating in the fellowship of Christ's suffering, Philippians 3.10. Then this little phrase, it says, from now on, from the point this most intense persecution takes place. Stick with it. Stick with it. This is another way of saying that if you are living at this period and you stay faithful, you will be blessed. If you are executed by the beast for your faith, you are blessed. Now, what I'm about to say here surprises some people, but it shouldn't be to those of you who know the word well. The Christian life is difficult. It's supposed to be. You are in constant conflict internally between the sin nature wanting to control you and the spirit wanting to rule. So we have to stay alert on that internal battleground. That's the flesh. Romans 8, 5 through 6. And then the fact that the world is the platform of Satan with his cosmos diabolicus, which is full of traps and distractions to pull the believer away from God, and that often works with the sin nature. Then there's the arch enemy of every Christian, the devil himself, manifested so prominently in these chapters as controlling the beasts that rule the world, working also through an animated image, an idol. All these challenges to endure by being obedient and faithful. And for that, God has given us the Spirit. And then we see that the Spirit agrees with what the God the Father has just said. This is the Spirit's first statement, by the way, in Revelation, and that's to agree with the Father. And then he adds something. He begins by saying, Yes, says the Spirit. Well, he's in agreement. Wouldn't we expect him to be? Though the Spirit has been busy in the writing of the book of Revelation uh, with John, he was the instrument of revelation of the seven letters when it says here, here's what the Spirit says. He brought visions to John as said in John 1.10. But here he confirms that there is blessing to those who die in Christ. And in part, he's going to say what that blessing is. That comes next. That they may rest from their labors. Well, that's part of it. This is eternal rest. That's the Sabbath rest. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. That rest where believers are finished with their labors on earth, dealing with sin, the flesh, the devil, living the Christian life among the sinful, the evil, the cosmos diabolicus. This, yes, is like a big amen. Yes, says the Spirit, amen. This is confirmation from the Spirit who has been enabling them to remain faithful, adding that their most difficult times will end and then the faithful may rest. It's going to be over. Just the opposite of the earth dwellers, the beast worshipers who go into torment with no rest, neither day nor night. 
Let's go back to 1411 just a moment, just to see that again. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, those who worship the beast in his image, and anyone who receives the mark of his name. The death of the earth dwellers is just the beginning of eternal torment. The unbearable, uh, we would call labor, every day, and there is no ending dealing with eternal torments in the lake of fire. No rest. And then we look at this last explanatory pray, uh, phrase here where it says, for the deeds follow them. For their deeds follow them. This is, a base, this is basically a way of saying the believer's good deeds of faithfulness and endurance, the results of that carrying right on into eternity. The deeds of enduring, staying faithful, obedient, of being a testimony, doing good work. Go with the believer, in a sense, to arriving in eternity. That's the luggage he takes with him. Your good deeds, your obedience, what you've done for the Lord, your service is going to go right there with you and be rewarded, ready to be rewarded in eternity. In other words, your reputation and works on earth follow you to heaven where you'll be justly rewarded for your deeds a frequent theme in scripture let me just uh, give you some of those i'm going to read through them I'll put them on the board there's a lot so i've just read through part of them okay then i'll give you some uh, we begin in the psalms psalm 62 12 jeremiah 17 10 Matthew 16, 27, Romans 14, 12, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 1 Peter 1, 17, and then we see several in Revelation. But let me read some of these to you. Uh, they too are sobering. I'll read, uh, let's read four or five of them here. I'll put them on the board. We'll begin with Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Romans 14, 12, Therefore each of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Well, we'll close there. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your precious word. It's been very challenging today. Uh, help us understand through the power of your spirit the importance of of enduring, being faithful, being obedient with a living faith. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.